are back. Steve Tilly is here with me, the one and only Steve Ew. Tilly. I love this man. Uh, I've worked together uh, with this guy for a long ass time on our television properties and our web stuff. And uh, he is an acclaimed writer, very well respected in the interactive industry and the entertainment industry, working still with the uh, Toronto Sun, but also doing a little bit more these days, right? Doing some consulting yeah. and writing, branching out, branching out, branching trying out, trying some new things. I think that's the way that everybody in media is kind of getting by right now, right? Trying new you things. You got to have a, got to have all kinds of side hustle, Absolutely. right? All kinds of side Absolutely. hustle. Absolutely. Well, Steve. I wanted to have you on. I mean, I'd like to have you on every day, but I, I, I think you'd get sick of us. But uh, I, wanted, I, wanted, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to have you on because I, I wanted to talk about this, uh, this Microsoft news, um, which we, we've heard yeah. things like this before. But what did you think when you first heard this? Uh, <laughs> I think there's, there's very little chance of this happening. You know, the, the Microsoft buying, yeah, like Microsoft is looking at a lot of companies. They're probably looking at every major studio out yeah. there um, in one respect or another. Buying something as big as EA, I don't know if that makes a ton of sense for Microsoft because you got to remember the EA, uh, you know, most of their business, over half their business is on the, the PlayStation platform. So for Microsoft to buy EA, it's either EA is going to be selling fewer games, which is not going to make the shareholders happy who, you know, would have to approve the yeah. sale, or Microsoft's going to pay a massive amount of money, which I don't think is going to make the Microsoft shareholders happy. Yeah. It's not a union that makes a lot of sense. I know that, that Microsoft is in a real kind of dire position in terms of exclusives. They're getting hammered by Sony yeah. um, and you know and Nintendo um, in the exclusives department. So there's there's obviously got to be some fixes there. I don't think purchasing EA in particular is going to be one of them, but um, I think we'll definitely see them acquiring a few more uh, uh, studios over the over this year. We're about to have this um, commercial for the future of video games with Ready Player One come out. Right. right? <laughs> and I, I I'm wondering. I, I I don't think there there's a correlation there, but there is this move towards um, kind of Netflixing the video game industry and right. and sort of populating your software wherever you, you know whatever screen you sit in front of. Valve has almost got us there. Origin has yeah. been trying to get us there. Do you think that the interest from Microsoft is more along those lines and more about forward thinking than catch up thinking? Yeah, well, there's talk of them. Uh, I mean, there's talk of them buying Valve as yeah. well, right? Um, and I assume that would that would entail them acquiring Steam. And then Valve is really more of a a distributor now than a, than yeah. a game publisher or, or, or developer. Yes. I mean, they're still doing games, but really Steam is their bread and butter, and that's how they've kind of revolutionized the way we way we play games and it's um, privately and held good. which is incredible right it, right which is good yeah. you know in a way it's good um so yeah microsoft's doing that kind of thing with game pass which is actually a really good deal it's really it's a really interesting step to be able to kind of, it's kind of like you know this the next the netflix vacation yeah. of video games being able to pay a monthly fee and pay and play you know uh, as many titles as you want um i don't know though i mean it's again it's i don't think we're quite there yet i don't know how that makes necessarily a lot of sense for studios to to invest in these AAA titles um, and then only get a cut of a, of a monthly fee. But, and yet, I mean, it works for Netflix, yeah. right? They're making money hand over fist and they've got so much money to pour back into development of, of TV shows and movies. So the model is there on the entertainment side. I'm just not sure if we're quite there on the game side yet. Let me throw this weird idea at you. Xbox right. Game Pass on the PlayStation 4. Ooh la la, wouldn't that be weird? Man, I can't even wrap my head around <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I long for the day when we have the great unification of, of gaming platforms, right? I mean, um, at least well, at least on sort of the PC, Xbox, uh, PS4, but PlayStation side, I think Nintendo's always going to do their own thing, yeah. as we'll probably be talking about shortly. But I think I would love to see some kind of unification across the other platforms and not have to buy not only different consoles or upgrade PCs, but these these weird incremental, you know, half generational updates uh, like the PS4 Pro and the Xbox One X, you know. Uh, it's it's not a model that's really attractive to anybody except the the, the holders, the companies. Yeah. So anything that brings a little more unification to gaming as a whole is good, is, is a good thing. I'm just not sure how we get from from here to there. Well, I, I, there's I, my mind starts reeling when I think about a deal like this because I think about the archival of all of these games and and oh, Lord, right yeah. and like there have been so many physical copies of games made that are almost and. You know, Sid Bolton would be one to talk to about this stuff. But there's, there <laughs> right. is this deluge of product and and valuable, you know, interesting software. We saw the success of uh, the Super Nintendo Classic and the Nintendo Classic with Nintendo. There's there is this nostalgic thing, but there's still an intrinsic value to that archive of software. And I I think mm -hmm. it's only through bold 
ideas and bold maneuvers like this that we're ever going to really move away from this disposable kind of uh, I, concept that we have around games. This is this is a yeah. business that is constantly throwing out everything. I mean, you can't even play backwards compatible software on PlayStation That's Four. Just it. You know, no. I mean, we're sitting on these these you know decades, literally decades of games that are, for all intents and purposes, no longer accessible. Like great games that. Like you said, we've got the NES Classic and the SNES Classic, but there's a whole gap, sort of the the, the original Xbox and original PlayStation era, which we're seeing some of these titles get revived or some of them being made available through through services. But uh, again, Xbox has got the right idea with their their backwards compatibility. Yeah. It, it, it's a really big deal to be able to take an old disc that you have sitting in your closet gathering dust, stick it in your, in your modern console and be able to play yeah. it. And But there's a still, there's so much, there's so much IP out there that is, again, we don't really see this in film and television. We've got you know, libraries of, of archives of, of, of movies and TV shows, dozens of services to access the stuff that, that that's really specific to genres. We don't really have something like that to access this hugely rich history of games that are kind of just sitting in limbo yeah. now. So yeah, again, I mean, we can move to something that, that opens up a huge library um, uh, of those old titles. That would be fantastic. But again, I'm not sure exactly how we get there. Like we're seeing that with, I mean, emulation is a big thing, obviously. Yep. The classic consoles are a big thing, but there's still like there's tons of games from the the PS1, PS2 era. They're just kind of lost in think, time right now. Think about how much money is game. just sitting right there. Exactly, right. it's all sitting on the table. Just got somebody's got to figure out the solution like to get people it. People were spending you know, five hundred dollars to get the Super Nintendo Classic, probably more than that. Yeah. You know, because they, they would they wanted it at all costs. And uh, you know, Steam I think has profited greatly from and players as well, from the idea that they can go back into a, you know, two decade old archive and play one of these right. classic games again at any time that they want. I, and like Steam, I think has has edged closer and closer to um, uh, being on a console, but it never has mm -hmm. gotten there. And I feel like mm -hmm. it, it's gonna be a massive sea change kind of idea and concept like this that's, that's gonna do it. And, the other thing that will happen from a, a massive deal like this, and I'm not suggesting that this is happening because it, it, it does seem outlandish, but it, it will almost become a savior, I think, of big budget software because mm -hmm. the uh, the audience opportunity is going to grow exponentially. You know, suddenly it's mm -hmm. it's like boom. You know, there's going to be a, the even what Microsoft has done with Game Pass could be a huge revolution for their video game business. Because there's going to be a lot of people that look at the dollars of that and go, well, this is a better deal. I don't need to own these discs on my my uh, shelf. Let's just pay 120 a month, 120 a right. year, and I've got access to all this stuff. Imagine if right. that was also filled with every EA game. And EA's got their own thing, so you know, it could be huge. Yeah, that's just it. We've got so many of these like little tendrils that are that are going all these different directions. Yeah. So maybe you know, maybe a Microsoft acquisition of EA would help help. Uh, uh, you know, consolidate some of that stuff. And they could also do, you know, they could do what they've done with Minecraft and make it, you know, uh, available on all platforms. Yeah. You know, Microsoft owns Minecraft, but you can play it on, you know, still play on the PlayStation, play it on the, on the Nintendo platforms. Maybe they would do that with EA or, you know, if the, again, I don't think this deal is ever going to happen, but if they if it did go through, it would give Microsoft the ability to basically hold things like, uh, you know, all the EA sports titles, Madden and, and FIFA and, and whatnot as Xbox exclusives, and uh, not to mention the stuff like you know, you know, Battlefront and Battlefield, and that would really hammer Sony. That would be a huge, oh, yeah. huge way for Microsoft to get ahead of Sony. But again, the numbers don't really quite make sense, and a lot of the other aspects of that deal don't make sense. Um, I think it's a smarter it play to not go exclusives route. You know, like if you're playing at that, well, yeah, at that saying, level, yeah, it's like it, it, it's sell as many as you can, and it feels like that's what right. they're thinking now with Play Anywhere, right? Like how many more people are playing yeah. Xbox games not on an Xbox since they started doing right. that? Yeah, no, and and, and Mike, again, Microsoft has done some really smart stuff yeah. with the with the Play Anywhere, with saying you buy one copy, it plays on your your PC or your Xbox. Um, you know, the 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 Game Pass library, they're doing all the smart stuff, and they've got great hardware. Like the the Xbox One, the Xbox One X is is a fantastic piece of hardware. Yeah. It's just that Sony has such a right now um, a significant, almost insurmountable lead in this generation. Yeah. That I don't know how Microsoft catches up, and I don't know how Microsoft deals with exclusives like Spider-Man and, and God of War, yeah. and you know stuff, and you know, Philosophers too. 
these are all things that are coming out this year, and um, you know it's hard to find an Xbox exclusive on the same level as, as any of those. Yeah, and the only way they get there is if they spend, right? Like they got to go out and they got to right. go out and buy some of these companies. It's such a shame right. that Lionhead is no longer with uh, Xbox. Can you can you think of some alternative like? Let's run Microsoft's game business here for a second. Let's have some fun. With oh, awesome! It. <laughs> can you can you think of some alternative ideas? Maybe some other studios, or maybe they should oh, be man. investing in IP in a direction. Well, I mean, rather than buying EA outright, it's too bad that Microsoft couldn't scoop up studios like Bioware, or like Visceral, or like you know some studios that have been closed right. down, or you know like Respawn and and Criterion uh, and Nurse. Yeah, because they've got. I mean, they've got the the sensibility. They they they're they're about you know, obviously the corporate money making mentality, but I believe at Microsoft there really is um, a genuine desire to create good games and, and make good games accessible. Yeah. yeah, and it's just, uh, I mean, it's, I think studio acquisition is probably the way to go, or um, I don't know, because I mean, remember the, the how much did they buy Rare for? Was it like yeah. hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. they bought Rare yeah. for? What came of that? Yeah. You know, what really came of that? So, um, yeah, I, th I, I think know. it's about, I, I, this, I mean, I really do think it's about making a bigger industry. That's what the the yeah. deal is, you know. And it feels like these juggernauts are kind of butting up against each other, and it's going to take one of them to like Valve could easily probably make a deal to Microsoft and say we're going to buy your Xbox division because we want to turn that into the <laughs> to the Steam box. Or EA could say, oh, you know, man. like we're we're going to buy Valve because we want to have all of it. It feels like they're all sort of going up against each other. And Sony came out with the right product at the right time at the right price mm -hmm. and and the right solution to what Microsoft's messages were, and they just catapulted forward with the PlayStation mm -hmm. 4, but they have this very closed off uh, exactly. ecosystem with their network and, and they're not even sharing, you, you know, like you can't even cross play on. on, on exactly. Platform. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, and it's funny because it's true. Sony has really succeeded with the, the actual, the titles, the, the exclusives yeah. where they're kind of spinning their wheels is, is with innovation with things like Microsoft has just leapt ahead in, in terms of that again with cross play and with the, Game Pass and then other stuff that they're doing, and then the whole Xbox Live uh, um, experience is actually really great. And they've they've been working on that thing for what 15 years now. They've really honed that to a, you know a fine edge. So Sony right now has all the all the cards in terms of um, uh, market share and and exclusive titles at least in 2018. Yeah. But I really feel like it's Microsoft that's doing the the, the innovating and uh, like they just got to find that one kind of magic bullet that 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 propels them ahead or. I don't know, maybe we tell the next generation, but what is the next yeah. generation? Are we really going to see? I mean, I guess we are going to see a PlayStation 5. Sony's already kind of, you know, I think sort of talked yeah. about that. But Microsoft is really, you know, they're really kind of leaning into this whole games as a service or games, you know, delivery as a service rather than, I think, the so much focused on the hardware, which is all these games on the PC. Like Microsoft says, we don't care where you play it, just play our games. You know, be part of our network, play our games. If it's on your PC, if it's on your, you know, your laptop, if it's on an Xbox, whatever. So I don't know, man. 2018 is gonna be really interesting. I mean, there's a this lot E3 of three is gonna be wild. This E3 is gonna be interesting, yeah. Because <laughs> everybody's gonna be racing to Nintendo because Nintendo's done so well with the Switch. We're gonna see oh, a Nintendo. lot, of, a oh, lot Nintendo. of third party support of the Switch, and just... uh, yeah, it's gonna be cool. I, you know, I, I feel like. I keep thinking of Minority Report and how prescient that movie was and yeah. how, you know, Spielberg had worked with a bunch of futurists to kind of define where exactly. we're going to, he mapped it out. And he's, I think we're doing that again with Ready Player One. And I keep thinking of that. It's just like, you know, consumers already mash all of this stuff up anyway. They don't really right. have this siloed allegiance that the companies all want. It. Like, we don't care what network a TV show is on. We don't care right. what, really, at the end of the day, what platform we're playing it on. We want that experience, you know? Right. And I feel like Ready Player One's going to put that out there. They're going to say, you know, you can have your Overwatch and your Street Fighter and right. your Akira. Right, all mashed together. And right? it's funny, too, because if you've been I don't know if you've been watching any of the, uh, the, the viral videos or the, the stuff around VR chat, but one of the cool things about VR chat, really, it's like a, it's like a primitive precursor to Ready Player One in the sense that people are adopting any sort of avatar. It's almost like Second Life was, yeah. was way back in the day. And we're seeing all these, you know, licensed characters appear in VR chat, then just mash them together. And that's kind of like the first baby step towards what we're going to see in Ready Player One. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it, it's way too far in the future, but I'm not sure what companies are going to 
can do to protect these properties or if they would even want to. I mean, are you okay with having Tracer and Master Chief and Freddy Krueger all exist in the same kind of universe? I don't know. It'll be interesting to see what happens when we get there. I think we're we, a little ways away from the Oasis just yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to that. We, we are edging closer to it, you know, and it, it, there is there is this thing that this Spielbergian Bergian kind of ability to kind of paint an image of it and we go, yeah, okay, we're going with that. <laughs> That sounds pretty cool. It's true, you know, and I mean, Lucas as well, right? He's uh, doing the research and saying, "Here's what, here's what might happen." But then he puts it out there, and all of a sudden, we're saying, "Oh yeah, we're not." It's not Minority Report building on what the futurists think. It's now we're building on what Minority, minority yeah. Report showed us was possible, right? Yeah, so. we saw that with the with Star Trek quite a bit too. Definitely. Okay, well, let's uh, speaking of uh, uh, forward thinking, um, but also lo-fi to the nth degree, like I yes. like. Nintendo came out and just shocked everybody with this announcement. And I, they, uh, yeah, did they ever? You, I, and I, I mean, you got invited and you went out to an event, but I, I feel like um, we got press releases about this thing. People might be interested in this and covering this thing. I know. And, and, and they couched it a bit. It's just like, this is for everybody that's young and yeah. young. Like, you could feel like there was a bit of like, I don't, I don't know if you're going to dig this, but it's yeah. coming. And it's so freaking cool. I think yeah. everybody that's, like, that you've played with it, how is. Labo. Well, okay. I, I I was sitting in a in a room full of uh, Nintendo people watching this video for the first time the day before it, it premiered online. Yeah. And I, so I'm watching the video and watching the you know that they're showing these cardboard sheets rolling off the assembly line. I'm like, what is this? And then somebody punching them out of buildings. I'm like, are you shitting me? They're building the cardboard <laughs> toys. But then when you when it's just I can't get my head around how how brilliantly this stuff is engineered. Um, yeah. The ideas they come up with to make this stuff work and 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 create these sort of it's it's like it's like toys to life except not it's like it's the toys are the game the toys aren't part of the game the toys are the game the switch yeah. is so perfectly integrated as a piece of hardware into these into these toys and the, i don't know how when i was looking inside the piano you have the little cardboard piano yeah and they basically they, they gave it to me fully assembled i built some of the other stuff but they gave this to me fully assembled and just let me play it, and I'm like, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, what is making this press on a cardboard piano key cause music to come with a switch screen? What is the, I couldn't understand that's how magic. these were working together. Yeah. And it's all just like the little Joy-Con stuck in the back that's got a camera scanning the inside of the piano, looking for little reflective strips that pop up when you press the key. I'm like, wow. who thought of that? Who thought wow. of that? Who designed that? How did that come about? And I was talking to um, our pal, uh, Reggie, these yep. may after yep. and he said that they he went hands-on with the first version of this over a year ago so they had this in the works before the switch was even released and they've really put a lot of thought and a lot of work in it and i think it is going to explode it's Absolutely. just the perfect combination of of video games that don't involve your your, your child you know just staring at a screen pressing buttons they're they're yep. involved they're building something with their own hands they're understanding the technology that makes these toys work it's just it's a perfect kind of combination of, of ideas. And I think uh, parents are just going to go bananas for it. They're like, this is a semi-educational thing. It's Nintendo. So you know it's going to be, you know, uh, wholesome. It's going to be well-designed. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be imaginative. It's just, but what other company could have done this? Nobody, yeah. right? Nobody no. could have done this. I mean, I think they've done that, like, with Tearaway and stuff like that in software, and they've mm -hmm. sort of presented the illusion of something like this, but to physicalize it is absolutely yeah. brilliant. It's yeah. it's a genius play because you're tapping into that uh, guilt-free playtime that That's Lego gets into it. guilt-free playtime. Right? And it's also recyclable. And so you're teaching oh, people to point. use... Right, you're too. Dude, teaching. that's such a good point. I never thought of that. It's like yeah, it's, it's like not... I could only flatten all my Guitar Hero instruments and put them in in the cardboard recycle. Now that would, I would be so happy. Is right. that I'm up a huge space in my closet? Yeah. I mean, it's very forward thinking, and you, and you have to think that Nintendo's been looking at the 3D printer explosion of creativity that's been going on there, and they're thinking, okay, we've got to get in there. And this idea of toys to life and and engage, I mean, that they've always designed their games that way anyways. Miyamoto's yeah. philosophy has always been to bring the outside inside. And I, I feel like they've probably toyed around with all this stuff. And probably in the future, we'll see some kind of more sophisticated 3D printing mechanism that allows us to, you know, create characters and robots and things like that. Down yeah, there. this is, I think this is very much uh, the first wave of a really long initiative, like a long, really long play. Um, yeah. 
you know, the stuff that's in the variety pack and, and the robot pack that are coming out in April are there. I mean, they're really cool, but they're, they're definitely first gen experiences. But um, I mean, you can think about all the possibilities of Nintendo building games that have uh, Labo components as part of the game, and then whether it's a special kind of controller or a little, you know, companion you build that, that interacts with the game. I mean, there's just, there's just so many places they can go with this. And the production cost of the stuff, I mean, the, the, there's a lot that went into the design and into the engineering. And really a lot goes into the software too. And especially the assembly instructions, which is something that's really minor that I keep coming back to. It's like, they could not be more clear. They could not be more perfect in that's explaining correct exactly which pieces you punch out for the first step exactly which orientation they should be in and you can go as fast or as slow as you want through the assembly you can you can zoom in on the 3d model on your screen it's like if ikea could do this my dresser wouldn't be about to fall down right now you know? it's <laughs> just the three screws are supposed to be in there just but, the um, audacity of nintendo to zag when everybody <laughs> is zigging like that's all they, that, that, that's, that's amazing that's, what an that's incredible what do, company you know? man like they're they're just so gutsy and weird and god we need them in this world don't we like they're yeah. they're just such an interesting bunch of people over there I, how is the software though? Like, is it fun? I have two. It's fun. Two, it's, I have three. Three big questions for you. Okay. Okay. How is the software fun? Aren't people going to be freaking out about scratching their switches? I mean, I was I was all about protective coding when the switch yeah. launched last year. It was just yeah. like, don't be careful putting it into the uh, into the dock and then and and then the other thing is like, how do you engage with another person? How do you make it fun for more than one person? Yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, the software is actually um, uh, the experiences they showed me, which they may may not be the complete experiences, but the experience they showed me with the variety pack, like for instance, the fishing game, it's very simplistic. It's um, um, you're just basically lowering your line down into the water, and the deeper you go, the harder the fish are to catch. The control is really fascinating in that it, the line on the fishing rod connects into a little base station that the switch sits in. And there's no connection between the tension on the line and the switch. There's no communication there. The line is just wrapped around a, um, a basically a spool inside the base station that's got rubber bands giving you tension. But the illusion of yanking on the line and, and it feeling like there's a fish there is super convincing. And and when you're struggling to reel in a fish and then you got to like let out some slack because it's fighting the line and you got to like go back and forth with the fishing rod, it's completely convincing. But I think that we're going to see kind of the first wave of experiences, at least in the variety pack kit, be fairly, um, I don't want to say shallow, but fairly simple experiences. You know, they're going to be more like, this is an introduction to Labo. This is how you build these things. Yep. This is how, you know, these are some things you can do with them. I think it's just going to get our head around what this is and what we can do with it. So there's nothing super deep that I saw anyway. I mean, there could be, for all I know, there could be like a, you know, a 20 hour campaign mode in the fifth mini game. I doubt it. <laughs> hey man, I wouldn't put it past Nintendo. Remember the, uh, <laughs> they had the, the zapper or whatever with uh, the Wii and they had that Legend of Zelda crossbow game that was oh, just right. like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It just it was a deep game. Like you could yeah. keep playing it. Yeah. <laughs> so but it is really fun to play. I mean, the piano is fun to mess around with. Um, the remote control cards, which I wasn't impressed with at first. Um, then I learned that it, there's all kinds of different stuff. They got, you know, it's got like an infrared camera on it. You can, you can actually have it guiding it through obstacles that you're watching on your screen. Wow. So again, I think it's more of an introduction to the concept and trying to get us familiar with what these toys are, what they can do, more than giving us really deep experiences off the top. Yep. The robot pack, which is its own separate kit, it's like a one experience kit, that I assume will be much deeper. I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of different gameplay elements to that. Um, I'm still not sure how it's going to hold up to yeah. a lot of this you know, kids yes. doing this or even in general these are cardboard toys and the cardboard is sturdy but it's but it's not so sturdy like it's got to be thin enough that you can easily fold it into these shapes right so it can't be like hugely thick corrugated cardboard that's going to yeah. stand up to anything so a lot dude, of times gonna get dude we're talking about cardboard though couldn't they <laughs> couldn't people just go and get more cardboard like well, they have the it. instructions and oh I, br I ripped my robot i'm gonna go There's get been... another bunch of cardboard and fix it yeah, there's been a lot of talk about that. Um, I think because the, the pieces are so well engineered, they're 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 very precisely cut, um, and they're all the fold lines are scored yep. on the back. So you're always folding along kind of a pre-existing little uh, you know little line that there to guide you. I think that would be kind of hard to replicate without you know okay. basically a cardboard printer of some sort that not a lot of people have access to. So Nintendo so, yeah, the has made fun. proprietary cardboard. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm curious to see what they're going to do about replacement parts because. <laughs> These are these are toys that are gonna be played with by kids, and you know kids yeah. are not gentle. I mean, kids nope. are gonna, gonna build that fishing rod, and they're immediately gonna start whacking. I've seen with, kids right? with cardboard. I have right. one that plays right. with cardboard all the time. Cardboard <laughs> is, goes all over the damn place. 
It's like on Christmas when all you want to do is get the cardboard tube out of the, uh, the Christmas wrap <laughs> so beating your brother over the head with it. Yes. So, I mean, the durability will be – it'll be interesting to see what Nintendo does in terms of providing uh, replacement pieces. Yeah. Um, I already forgot what the second question was. Uh, the, sc- the Switch itself, were you at all nervous oh, about the no. Switch? No? No, it's housed – in each experience, it's either, either you're just holding your hand or it's housed in a very um, – secure cardboard kind of cradle so you're not ever uh really even touching the screen you're, you're playing with toys and the the, the switch is kind of there to provide a screen but but, but for like the fishing game it sits in a nice you know snug cardboard cradle it's angled it's not going to fall out unless somebody kicks it over so i don't get to be concerned i don't think i don't think the switch hardware is in any kind of real danger in any of these uh these these toys okay that's cool and then f- like multiplayer is there stuff to kind of bring somebody else in or, or it's um, like, fold it this way? No, fold it that way. No, <laughs> oh, look, just sit over there. I'm going fi- to, I'm I'll fix it. I'll do it. I think really the kind of multiplayer experience here is going to be people just working on the, the, the toys together or specifically parents and kids working on the toys right. together because um, the, I think it's sort of aimed at kids seven, seven, and eight and older mm-hmm. and some of the stuff is you know i was i was trying to build these toys again in front of a whole bunch of nintendo people watching <laughs> me which is hugely nerve-wracking you know it's like I think when we were playing a game at e3 and the developer sitting right next to you oh yeah it's like that times 10 because you have to you're, you're building these little cardboard models and you know there's some really fine folds in some of them and they so have I think, a, like a room filled with other people that want to come in and do the same thing exactly. with you. yes so um so yeah, I think for uh, younger kids, like kids around seven and eight, there's going to be definitely some, probably some adult involvement. Some of the the models, like the piano and the house, uh, especially the piano, are like dozens and dozens of pieces. So it's it's not a it's not a simple project to put together. Some of these yeah. things. So I think the the sort of cooperative multiplayer, if you will, component will be the actual assembly of the toys. Um, other than the remote control cars, I think that's the only one that's really got a two player. Kind of experience to it um, right. that I saw anyway. Again, I'm right. not I wasn't seeing the full depth of what each piece of software is going to offer, but it looked like they were mostly solo experiences. But something that you could, you know, like your kid is is interacting with a little house and making you know the little, the little creature do stuff in the house, and you're there watching and, and you're making suggestions or you know just encouraging or just you know watching your your child play and, and experiment with this. I think that's kind of where the you know, the, the, the collaborative multiplayer experience is going to come again in the first wave, who knows what we're going to see, you know, in the third or fourth generation of these things, you know, what the, what kind of stuff will come up with, because just right out of the gate, they've already got these really incredibly inventive and well-engineered toys. And that's on the first try. And that's like the first two packs coming out in April. And they're going to have um, other ones I think later this year. And it, I mean, it's, I, I can't wait to see what they do with this uh, throughout 2018 and, and in coming years. Do you think that uh, we're we're going to be talking about uh, a huge success here with with Labo or? Oh yeah. We, oh, yeah. oh yeah. yeah. I mean, I have learned now never to underestimate Nintendo. <laughs> uh, I really distinctly recall seeing the Wii, the, the original Wii at E3 for the first time, and I was like, "What the hell? Seriously, tennis or wagging these little controllers like tennis? <laughs> yeah, that's gonna be good for five minutes for like children." Right. And and you know the Wii did okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, and the Switch, same thing. I, again, I remember you and I being at the event here in Toronto seeing the Switch. I'm like, okay, yeah. well, it's cool, but you yeah. know, it's not the same fidelity as the the PS4 or Xbox One. It's uh, you know, it's only about three hour battery life, and when it's out of the dock, it's. I didn't. I I, I thought it was going to flop. I, I admit, I thought it was going to flop. I have yeah. been proven drastically wrong now. <laughs> Well, you, know think- what, you know what the Switch did, right? Like, it was a weird concept that you felt like you had to kind of explain over and over again. But I think when you actually touched it and played mm-hmm. with the games, there, it was so simple. The concept of, oh, I can, I don't have to stop. I can exactly. bring it with me and then I can keep going. Like, they show the marketing and all the commercials and you'd, you'd watch it and go, okay, that's, that's clever, but are people going to mm-hmm. want to actually... And then you don't want to live without it. And so yeah. now <laughs> it's so, so, such a good machine that it kind of creates a new issue for them. It's like, how do you follow that up? And how do yeah. you have that other category for your, 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 you know, your uh, portable gameplay? Like they've had so much success with it, the, although they are still doing fine with 3DS. Yeah, they sure are, yeah. But it's, uh, yeah, they, they, it's like they're so successful with these wacky ideas that they create yeah. an, a new sort of dilemma for them. Yeah, and that's just it. I think you know nobody's done anything. Nobody could do anything what uh, similar to what they're doing with the the Labo. I mean, I remember kind of Sony kind of trying some of the stuff with the PlayStation Eye camera. They had that 
Harry Potter right. magic book that uh, oh, yeah. was, that AR kind of experience it was really cool, but it just did not take off at so all. So clunky though. That was yeah, uh, there were and that's just I mean, it. We're yeah. having that issue with VR right now as well, right? Like yeah. there's just so many little bits and pieces and things have to be plugged in all over the place. And, yeah. Uh, you got to make it elegant. You got to make it simple. Yeah. And, and that, that is the one thing that I think about with Labo. Like, is this a continuous piece of, uh, you know, software? I guess they can test it out and they can see how it is. But I don't know if people keep coming back, you know, like. Is, I mean, that's the question, right? It could yeah. be a novelty that wears off. Um, well, I kind of thought that Switch would be a novelty at first. I thought everybody would buy it out of the gate and then say, okay, well, what I want to hold this thing around and play games on. And then you realize I'm playing freaking Legend of Zelda. Yeah on the bus and I'm not yeah. playing like a 3DS scaled down reimagining of Zelda. I'm playing yeah. the full on, you know, open world Zelda experience in my hands. And that it's just another, such an eye. Another idea. thing, Oasis, like, I feel like we're plugging ready player one a lot today, but <laughs> you know, it's another one of these things where it's like, I can be in my beautiful virtual world anytime, anywhere I want to be now, exactly. you know, it's uh, it's a new, new way of thinking around video games. Yeah, and I think, but yeah, to go back to Labo, I think that when the packages, the packaging is super slick, the instructions are super slick, the cardboard has a really nice feel to it, and it's really well, like when you punch the stuff out, there's no rough edges, there's no little hangy bits on it. Yeah. They've done such a good job of imagining this, and I think it's gonna, I think it's gonna explode. I think, again, going back to what we were saying earlier, parents are gonna see this and say, this is, like you said, yeah. guilt-free gaming. This is something yeah. that I can do that will, you know, let my kid play with their Switch, which they're going to do anyway, but also get me involved, get them involved building stuff, get them involved learning how this stuff works. It's just such a, like an easy sell to, to parents. And I think it's going to, I think it's going to fly off the shelves. I mean, I could, this could be the one, I could be another time I'm wrong about Nintendo in the other direction. Yeah. But I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be a, a huge success this year. And, um, you know, we'll see. We'll see if it's a one-trick pony. Or we'll, we'll see. It's almost like a new platform unto itself. Well, the the idea of the um, uh, cardboard being disposable and recyclable and all that stuff mm -hmm. is is uh, I think it's in the win category. But it's also um, if you really love the piano that you build, that that yeah. idility, the idea of that fragility of that, or something ripping or tearing, and and sort of juxtaposed against what you're actually paying to build all of that stuff. That's yeah. going to be the secret sauce on on how successful all of this is, I think. Yeah, the price was a. Uh, I felt the price was a little high, I and mean, we I don't know if we've got um, Canadian pricing yet, but it's yep. like what seventy bucks for the variety kit, and I think eighty bucks for the robot kit, US. Yeah. And that seems like a lot, but then when you think about it, the variety kit seventy bucks. That's for five different toys. Really, you're getting five yep. toys. So that one of which is a piano that plays like a piano, which was like this really cool house that you, you know, your switch lives inside, and a little creature lives on it. So it's not. I think it's probably a fair price, but um, people are going to have to wrap their heads on the idea of paying 70 bucks for a package of cardboard, right? And, uh, <laughs> but again, we pay 70 bucks for a game, you know? That's so true. It's, it's not, it's true. You know, it's, it's it, not we're, really... we're paying for the experience. It's not exactly. really for, like, ultimately, that's what we're doing, right? We're escaping into this experience, and Nintendo is crafting this stuff, so it is that. Yeah. Uh, I, I can't wait. I can't wait to, you know, to test this stuff out and to especially play this with my kid. Yeah, Super excited about that. But, uh, you know, I, I, I've, I, you know, I want to talk a little bit more about other things that are that are currently cooking right now. But if anybody has questions or comments or anything, have you seen anything, Blake? Has anybody uh, popped up with uh, anything for Mr. Steve Tilly? Uh, yeah, people want to know how thick and durable the cardboard is. Okay, okay how thick and durable is the cardboard? I guess well, that's the, just it. It's um, it's a little thinner than say like a, uh, like an Amazon shipment shipping box. It's it's okay. it's not thin. It's not fragile. But again, it's got to be thin enough that it's easily foldable. Right. So, I feel like they've engineered the stuff so well. Like the, the tabs fit into the slot almost almost like with a snap, like a really satisfying click. And once you've got all the pieces assembled together, it's pretty sturdy. Like I was reefing the hell out of that fishing rod, and the only thing that happened to it was one little kind of cosmetic piece on the reel that I hadn't folded quite properly uh, fell off. And that was yeah. it. But I mean, I was tugging on this thing. I, mean, I was trying to wrestle this giant manta ray from the depths <laughs> of the ocean up into my boat. And, you know, it held up. And then again, that's only like, you know, 10, 10, 15 minutes of play, but it certainly wasn't falling apart. It's, it's, it's as durable as it can be for the thinness that it has to be to be, you know, Easy enough to assemble the hand. I, I'm just, I'm try, I'm, I'm kind of chuckling because I'm just thinking of the idea of either Sony or Xbox <laughs> presenting so this. Is this. Just it. 
<laughs> this is it. There's no First way all, they, they could do it. They couldn't do it. It's just, it's just not in their, their universe. Even if they had the exact same idea. Well, first of all, they, you know, they don't have handheld consoles that they can put in, yeah. you know, something like this. Maybe, maybe somebody should have done this with the Vita back in the day and that would have, uh, <laughs> that would have saved it. But no, I mean, this is literally something only Nintendo could do and can do right now. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's just so weird and endearing and, and fun to watch them doing, you know, watching, you know, Xbox and PS4, you know, roughly parallel, um, you know, experiences. Nintendo's like, they're not even, they're, they're over there <laughs> doing their own thing. They don't care. They're not watching what the other guys are doing that closely. They're just saying, we got these, these wacky new things. We've we got this this handheld console that'll play anything. We got these cardboard toys and it's just, they're just, <laughs> they're doing things that only Nintendo can. That's Good, for awesome. them. Good for them. Well, it, you know, and you know that a lot of these decisions were uh, sort of initiated by the lack of interest in the Wii U, you know, which was mm -hmm. also filled with great ideas, but they just couldn't generate it. And I love that Nintendo says, okay, well, we're going to take this uh, position of, uh, uh, I, I hate to say weakness or failure, but this position of being sort of beat down in the sales thing, and let's, let's double down and let's come up mm -hmm. with some really innovative new ways to go. And I feel like Microsoft should be in that position right now too, because they've been in this sort of neck and neck race with, yeah. with PlayStation and, and sort of jostling for the lead, depending on what generation of console that they have. And they're, they're phenomenal machines. They're incredibly, mm -hmm. you know, rich with, uh, with great stuff. There is, I think a, um, uh, Mostly because I think the cost to make AAA has just become so expensive. I don't think that there is that sort of bounty of lots of AAA game makers ready to rock that yeah. they can that, that are instant solutions for Microsoft. So I feel like this is the time for them to say, "Look, we're," st and they've been saying it the last couple of years. We're staying in games. We're not selling the Xbox division. Yeah. We're going to come up with some really cool new, you know, ideas. But this is their time to to shock us. Yeah, their ideas yeah. I think will be on the you know the the sort of service side as opposed to coming up with some, some kind of new hardware innovation. I don't see I don't see Microsoft ever making like a you know a portable uh, console. I and mean, we've seen them dabble in VR. They're, they are dabbling in VR and yeah. in mixed reality, um, and it hasn't really you know caught on fire uh, by any stretch yet. But um, I think their strength lies in the software and the back end that, that serves these things, and that's where they're gonna that's where they can innovate. Yeah. Um, Sony's again. Sony's strength lies in the the, the exclusives. Um, and just, you know, really, really smart, I don't know, I guess kind of a, a really good eye for what a studio can bring. Like things like something like Guerrilla Games, the makers of Killzone, yeah. making an open world, completely <laughs> new IP with, you know, a, a, a primitive technological mix with a heroine with a, with a bow. It just sounds so out there. And yet they created one of the best games of last year with, yep. with Horizon Zero Dawn. And it's, um, you, you know, nurture that, a good right? eye for that. Yeah, What's that? Sony. You got to nurture it. Sony has exactly, got an amazing exactly. eye for that, and they they saw that five years ago, which is absolutely incredible. Yeah. The other thing that's that's been going on too recently. There's nothing to kind of show. We don't have footage of it or anything. But Phil Harrison, who you had major stints at Sony and Xbox, is now at Google. He's a VP at uh, at Google. Mm -hmm. um, presumably, he's a game executive, and he used to be a developer. And he's a great guy, and he's got a huge resume and a lot of history and experience and relationships all throughout the business. Presumably, Google is going to get serious about something games-wise, and and uh, we may see the oasis from them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if anybody can make it happen, it's Google. Yeah. They've got you know a hundred bazillion dollars if they yep. want to create uh, create oasis, and yep. you know they they've got the the first steps with their their sort of you know. VR, the the daydream uh, hardware is, is kind of their, their steps into VR, and for yep. what it is, you know, for a hundred dollar device that holds your phone, um, it's there's some decent experiences in that thing. So, yeah, I mean, who knows? Um, I I really want to I really want to get there. I really want to get there with VR. Um, it's not there yet, and I'm really seeing. Um, and we're seeing the new generation of Vive. The Vive Pro is coming out. Uh, yep. Pimax has got their their wacky giant headset, but all the all the reports or reports are that these things are are, are you know, steps ahead, but there were still where we need the the uh, the VR headset that is completely wireless, um, doesn't require a two thousand dollars supercomputer to run, mm -hmm. um, and it's easy to get on and off. And we're just, I think, we're still a couple of years at least from that. And yeah. four, two, you know. all of these moves, though, all of these, you know, massive deals like Minecraft and and uh, you know, Nintendo coming out and being successful with the Switch. 
And you see a major studio and a major director say, look, we want to make a, a movie about video games this way. And then there's right. the new Wreck-It Ralph 2 and stuff and right. Tomb Raider. It all points to the future is pretty rosy for games. Like, it's it's not going away. As rocky as it is, and we can mm-hmm. get mired in stuff like the, uh, um, you know, the, the pay-to-win uh, loot right. box, you know, controversies, it's not going away. Things are going to get solved, and we're going to have incredible interactive experiences. Some of them might be with cardboard. I like it. I like that. I like that. I like that rosy vision of the future. And I think you're, no, you're probably right. You're it's probably going to be bumpy, but it's going to be super fun. We'll get there. We'll yes. get there. And, and brother, it is amazing to have you on our television. It's like you were made for television. You're here on TV right now. It's like I'm it's, watching TV. It's, it's I love like it. I was on to come to the show for five years. Before. It's crazy. <laughs> well, we'll have you yeah, on I'll, I'll again. I'm always here to to gap, but whatever you want to gap. Awesome. Well, I'll ping you again soon, my friend. Thank you so much for joining us.